All week long, we've been talking about how this is going to change our approach to sexual assault processing or it's evidence processing, and we really think it will. And Kelly and I have sat down, and we've talked about this, and she, you probably heard her talk about, hey, this is really going to save us some time and all this kind of stuff, and we're going to be able to do it easier, quicker, better. We have new capabilities. We have improved capabilities. How can we put all of this together in a single process or a single set where we can go from one test to another without losing anything. You know, that's the main thing you want to do. If you want to run a test or say you want to do an extraction, you do that and you run your test and 20, 30 microliters later you're out of sample. Now you go back and do another extraction. What if you could do everything you want to do in one set of runs, one run through? And that's what this, this process that we're looking at, uh, we feel this is a really neat process to do because and it, it's right now it's first generation. We haven't even maybe zero generation, because we really haven't tried all of it yet together. We haven't put the whole package together. But this is kind of a goal of what we want to do with this instrument. It may change. We may say, okay, well, we can't do it this way, but we can do it this other way better. So this is still a, a work in progress, but it's an idea. It's a goal of what we're trying to put together and how this instrument can be used to really improve sexual assault processing, use the new capabilities, use the improved capabilities, and use the ability of what we're already doing with the sperm sperm identification. Goal, comprehensive process. Improve the process of sexual assault evidence using the laser microdissection microscope. Expedite processing of sexual assault evidence. We've, Kelly's talked about that. Hey, we've gone in there and, and she says we can do it. She can finish four cases in, in three days. That's a lot faster than her, our normal output. I don't know if she's really going to do four cases in three days. Three cases? Four cases, two days. Four, two days. <coughs> That's a 50% cut. So, <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll give you a 50% raise. It used the enhanced capabilities for the analysis of different types of sample. In other words, can we use the sperm paint or the uh, fluorescent identification sperm to help us look at those samples where we previously had, couldn't find sperm? Provide new capabilities of analyzing mixtures. Can we use the same process that we use for diploid cells? Can we put that all together in one big long run? Can we look for sperm, look for the enhanced sperm, and then go back and use that same sample and use it for fish, use it for the chromosome paint? Y'all all know if you've been in this lab, in working at a crime laboratory after six months that virtually everything or much of the stuff that comes in sexual assault evidence, you have all sorts of things, vaginal swabs, vaginal washing, bite mark, neck, breast swabs, oral rectal swabs, uh, suspected semen stains, urogenital stain swabs, fingernail samples. We get all of those. If you have a sane nurse program in your area, you probably get all sorts of samples because they like to collect a lot of them. We have, what, 19 different samples in our rape kits now, perineal swabs, cervical swabs, in addition to the vaginal swabs. Have you all seen now the cervical swabs going out for like seven days, at least for the YSTRs? Maybe there's something in there that we, we haven't even looked at that with this microscope yet. Why, why, what's out there that we're finding the male YSTRs after seven days? Maybe this is something we can pick up. I think Jack Valentine's supposed to be here next week. He's the one big on that. So there may be some other stuff that we don't even know that we can use with this microscope yet. But we want a, a comprehensive process where we can look at all of it without losing anything, but yet putting all these enhanced and new capabilities into the same package where we can just take a sample and go all the way through with it. If we look at sexual assault evidence, again, y'all most that. So vaginal swabs washing, what do we do mostly? Spermatozole epithelial, you typically do a differential extraction. Bite mark, neck, breast swabs, typically that's epithelial, epithelial mixtures, but it could be a sperm epithelial mixture. Sometimes you don't know. Are you going to do a standard uh, extraction, one where you just put the sample in the lysis buffer and go? Or do you do, do, do a differential? Well, you don't know at the front end, do you? You don't know if a stain that's been collected from the shoulder or neck or chest is going to be mixed with sperm, or is it just uh, epithelial cells? Uh, oral rectal swabs, that could be a sperm epithelium. Do a differential on that. Suspected semen stains. That could be a sperm epithelium. It could be an epithelial epithelial mixture. You don't know. Often you don't know what's important, so you're going to do, maybe do a differential. Urogenital swabs, 
stain swab, sperm, epithelium, 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 don't know. Again, you're not positive. Most of the time when you get those types of samples, you automatically assume there's going to be sperm or semen in there. So you're going to start a differential. Uh, we get a lot of very, or not a lot of young children, but in many instances when you have a young child rape, often those are epithelial, epithelial mixtures. They're not always uh, sperm epithelial mixtures or semen epithelial mixtures. Fingernail swabs, those are typically epithelial, epithelial mixtures or epithelial blood stain mixtures. Uh, and so you'd use a standard extraction on those. But sometimes there may be semen mixed in there or spermatozoa. You don't really know. Unless you look at it microscopically, you're not going to see if there's any spermatozoa in there. And if you do a, a standard extraction and there's spermatozoa in there, what's going to happen? You're going to end up with a mixture and may never know that you had spermatozoa in there that you could have cut out and gotten the individual male profile on it. But with a microscope, you can see that. You can evaluate your sample. Right now, oftentimes, you just put a sample in digest buffer and go. Not thinking there may have been semen in there. Yeah, in most cases, burglars and stuff like that, we're really not looking for semen. But we don't know, always know where the semen is going to show up on a victim's body. Sometimes they don't always tell us where it might be. Sometimes they're, they're historical notes or the notes that are taken at the time of examination doesn't indicate <coughs> that that neck swab might have semen in it. If you look at your typical differential extraction, you've got a number of steps here. You start with your cellular extraction uh, from the supernate. And I think Kelly did a little bit of this. Uh, acid phosphatase P30. And you typically spot about 10% in your pellet. What's that for? Just simply to see if there's spermatozoa present, right? That's all you looked at those for. Uh, you go through the epithelial digest, sperm wash. You're going to repel it or re-smear some of that to see if you can get a few more. See if you can get, see, well, evaluate your differential. Make sure you didn't get any epithelial cells into the sperm fraction. Or if you did, you want to see that you did. Also to identify sperm, especially in the case of instances where you may have had a heavy epithelial fraction. Sperm digest, purification, quantification, and then you do your amplification. Uh, most agencies use two amps to a profiler plus cofiler. Uh, we use SGM plus profiler. Some agencies only do one amp and it's identifier or Prowerplex 16 or something like that. Amplify both the sperm and the epithelial fraction. The differential extraction, and again, I'm not telling you a whole lot you don't already know here, but uh, I just want to put it all in context here. Used for semen containing samples, the strength separates sperm and epithelial DNA. You use microscopic identification of cells, which I think is good. Um, it has the internal QC check of checking the vaginal, the epithelium against the, sp uh, the uh, sperm extraction. Weaknesses, uh, cell extraction may not get all cells off the specimen. You may not be able to get all the cells off the swab. I talked about that a little bit during the break where on cotton swabs, you may only get in, be getting 25 to 30% of the total cells off of there with just a PBS extraction. Uh, the, uh, the sample consumes part of the sample for microscopic examination and quantification. In other <coughs> words, you make a spot with 10% of the pellet two times. That's 10% that you're removing of sperm cells. If there's sperm cells in there and there's maybe only 100, well, you, you're already removing 10% of them and you're going to do it again. So you're actually taking some of the sample out of there and losing it. Um, User intensive, this is pretty much a hands-on procedure. When you start doing the, the, uh, this extraction procedure, you're pretty well tied up for a while. You can't uh, run away and leave it for three hours and let it get down to zero and come back again. You've got to do a lot of pipetting, a lot of manual washing. Yes, I, I know there's some things that are going on through automation with this procedure, but my belief is when you automate samples or automate this type of stuff, you give up something. You may give up a little bit of quality to increase the quantity of samples that you can run. Any type of automation will often give up, uh, in this work, will often give up some quality because you're, <coughs> you're essentially treating every sample as the same when we know that every sample that we get in a rape case is not always the same. Uh, one, another weakness, you can't always get a clean separation. In, in instances where you have a large number of epithelial cells, you may not ever be able to get a good, clean sperm fraction with no, no epithelial carryover, DNA carryover. 
It's just impossible, especially if, and I talked about that earlier, especially if you have a few numbers of sperm to begin with. Cannot separate sperm, non-sperm cell mixtures. In this case, what do you do in the case of a vasectomy or vasectomized male? It, may, it won't work. They're not going to show up in the sperm fraction. And it's going to be an epithelial cell fraction mixture. You may be able to pick up the, a small bit of the Y. Say, so, yep, there's some Y in there. And maybe it'll do Y filer on that, but it's still not the good statistic that you could get if you could have a random match probability. If we look at a standard extraction, this is one where you just you don't expect there to be any spermatozoa in there. You're not going to do any type of cell differentiation. You just start your cell extraction, maybe presumptive test. You could do blood on this, or uh, some people do hemostatics or orthotolidine or a phenylphthalein. Then you just go straight through the digestion, purification, quantification, amplification. That's a pretty good method of doing digestion. You get a real high percentage of recovery of the DNA on that. However, if it's a mixture, it's a mixture. There's no effort in there made to do any type of separation. <coughs> if it's a sperm epithelial mixture, well, you get the DNA mixture from both. If it's two epithelial cells, two different epithelial cells in there, you get the mixture of the DNA. You do not get any separation. There's no way it's currently in these differential and or standard extraction to separate your diploid cell DNA. If you have a male and female, there's no way to separate those or, or put those out. And again, the standard extraction used for non-sperm containing samples. Strengths can digest sample directly with good DNA recovery. Very simple procedure. You can start it. You know, right before you go home at night, let it digest overnight and come back and purify it the next morning. You can do, a, do an organic purification. We like the easy one for many of these samples. Uh, it's really quick. does almost as good as or just about as good as the organic extraction for DNA recovery. Weaknesses, cellular extraction, not often done to identify cells. In other words, you don't know what you have in there. In some instances, you may actually have semen in there or spermatozoa in there, and you don't know it, but you just go ahead and do the extraction. You don't make any attempt to identify what type of cells in there. You just say, okay, here it is, go. <coughs> Digest. Lice, we purify you and run the samples. Um, cannot identify mixtures prior to data analysis. In other words, you don't know you have a mixture until after you've done the analysis and you run it on the 3130 or the 377 and you say, uh-oh, I got three or four different alleles that most of these loci here. Or I've got a little bit of a male in there. A little bit of Y coming in. Uh, presumptive testing may require resampling. Some people actually take out a sample and extract it and then go back and, and retake it out. Uh, also on the weakness, unable to resolve some mixtures. Some of these mixtures are so complex or there's such a small component of one of the uh, male or female components that you can't separate those, those DNAs, that DNA out just based upon a concentration issue. If we're looking at this process that I'm talking about or I'm, I'm proposing here, laser microdecession process, we still start with a cellular, cellular extraction. It's the end of the class. My L's are running together when they put three of them in the same word. Uh, so cell, cellular extractions, you still start with that where you're getting the cells off the substrate. This is something you do anyway. As Kelly talked about, you can still do the APP30 on the supernate, but now what we're doing is we're proposing to put 100% of the pellet on the slide. Not 10%, we're gonna put it all there. We don't, we're gonna do everything we need to do off of that slide. We're not gonna switch from tube to tube or change processes, go back and re-extract. We're gonna do everything we need off of that sample on, the swap, on that slide. Set, we look at the slide, we do some type of cell dissection. We do our pre digestion and then go directly to amplification. We're not going to do a lot of the alternate processing. Everything we need to do, the whole sample is on that slide. Whatever we need to do will be from that slide or whatever we choose to do will come from that slide. 
even storage. We can store that slide. That's what I was going to ask how you do store them. Because, like, when it's in a tube and stuff, you know, it has a nice little lid. You can put it in the fridge and stuff. But what do you do as far as storage for the slides? Put it in a little microscope slide holder and close it up, and you can put a label on the outside of it. You can put labels on it, and you can store it room temperature or, or refrigeration or freezing. That was something I've thought about because I don't, you know, I was thinking about that. How are we going to store the slides and say for casework? Right now, you know, the way I, I store my, I don't, I, don't, I don't even do what Christine does and freeze them and whatnot. I actually just keep them in a, you know, we have these boxes. You can, you know, slides have the grooves. Mm -hmm. And then I've just been doing everything at room temperature like that. Now, obviously, if you have cases, are you going to want to put them, and actually, they're not even right next to each other because, you know, you have gaps in between the slide um, versus <coughs> taking a little slide yeah. folder, mailer or whatever, and shutting it on top, is that going to do anything to your sample on the foil? You know, I don't know. That's why I use those the ones that you saw in the lab. Is that what you the use? Little, little plastic oh, five yeah, older. Yeah. 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 And you can use those because something like that per case or something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, or if it's a, a word product or, yeah. As a side note, I would recommend a individual case in a box. These okay. boxes are not that expensive. Yeah. The, the, putting it in a cardboard. Thing where you're exposed, you can possibly rub it. Yeah, not a good idea. Yeah, and you can actually put two slots in those little holders you're talking about. Normally, have room for like five, five. slides. Yeah. Five, yeah, five. Yeah. So you could put three in there and still right. have Separate. gaps in between. Yeah. It's probably that would probably be ideal. Yeah. The same case, yes. Because that foil can tear if you poke it or something. It can tear. Yeah, I mean it. But also, if there's any type of contamination issues. And the the point is now we've got dried onto a. Onto a slide. How do you normally store your samples in? Dry, correct? So. No, probably in the tube in the freezer. Freezer. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, if you're like most of your vaginal swabs that you have anyway are dried. Yeah. That you store. So this would not be. This is not going to put in extraordinary storage. Yeah. To it. I know a lot of people now are doing room, you know, room temperature storages. Mm -hmm. On dry not samples. Not necessarily freeze. Not yeah, dry. Right. I mean, if you wanted to process the sample, put it on the slide. And examine it under the microscope. Yeah, you see something, or no, you don't see anything. You can then store it away, or once you've got it dried onto the slide, it then becomes something you can store <coughs> until you get to it, or archive later on, until later on. Now, obviously, once we do some of the other processes to it, then we may have to store it a little bit differently, or uh, maybe back to the refrigerator or something. But at least just putting the sample on the slide and drying it on there initially, it's no more than if it was dried onto a swab. Nope, not a whole lot different than how you got the sample in the first place. And we may have to do like an age study. You know, how we'll do that. I'm not sure of that. But I think, again, that's part of a novel validation. I think, doesn't it talk about age still when, you, you, when you're doing gui in the guidelines? Has anyone read the validation um, guidelines for a novel validation recently? I think it talks about maybe doing age studies. So that may be something, you know. That would take forever. But you, you store a slide and then let's say go back to it six months or a year later and see if we still can get that DNA type or whatever. What is kind of neat about, the, neat about this is for all types of sexual assault evidence. We could do this on a bite mark swab, a breast swab, a neck swab, perineal swab, vaginal swab, rectal swabs. You just take, do the cellular, cellular extraction dry it on the slide, and then you've got the slide ready for examination. Uh, the strengths of this type, if you're doing the semen stains, of course, you have the clean separation of sperm and epithelial DNA. We've talked about that. Uh, microscopic identification of cells <coughs> increases sensitivity and uh, minimizes handling. You're not having to do all these tube swaps. You just look on the microscope. If you see the cell that you want, identify the cell that you need, the sperm, the epithelium, you just simply cut it out and do the analysis of it. You can then put the slide back in the in the point and be re-examined later on. Uh, you don't have to minimize it. Quantification is done by cell counting. We've looked at that. We believe that, that that's certainly a viable objective. Fluorescent attachment uh, provides new capabilities. The weaknesses is requires cellular extraction. Now, if you're doing the like bite mark swabs or fingernail scrapings, now you may be able to just go directly to a direct extraction, which probably has a little bit more sensitivity, but you still have to deal with mixtures there. Uh, requires nuclear, uh, nucleated cell identification, but that's something that you already have to do. That's why that's in italics. 
cannot separate same-sex epithelial cell mixtures. Well, we can't do that now anyway. So those last two weaknesses that I have for this procedure are really weaknesses of all the procedures. They're not just identified to this new process. How do we, what's the proposed analysis method? You make the swab, or make the slide, I'm sorry, make the slide, spot it on there, the whole pellet, about 25 microliters, that's what Kelly was talking about. You examine it under bright field microscopy, gives you faster analysis, microscope, microscope cell separation, purification, perform it in a single step. If you can identify the spermatozoa on the slide, you can go ahead and do the dissection, collection in the tube, and the amplification. Again, eliminates the DNA quantification, better DNA separation. We've shown that most of the time, or nearly all the time, we get good, clean separation with this method. And again, bright field microscopy. What happens if you don't find the slides, or don't find the spermatozoa? We then go to fluorescent microscopy, fluorescent labeling of sperm spermatozoa. Gives us a little bit more sensitivity. If we really want to check it to see if there's none there, it gives us more confidence in negative, easier, faster identification. More confidence in negative samples. You can scan that, that smear a whole lot faster. That lower magnification with more confidence. And then, if you need to, you can still go on and do fluorescent labeling of X and Y chromosomes. In this instance, you can compare separate, different uh, sex epithelial mixtures, which is a capability you do not have now. All of this is proposed to be done on that same smear. You don't have to make a separate slide for each of these tests. You start out with the first test with a Christmas tree stain, the nuclear fast red stain. If you see nothing, you do a sperm stain, the sperm fluorescent sperm stain. If you see nothing, but you see epithelial cells in there, you can then do the X and Y chromosome all, all on the same slide, just consecutive sequential testing. You can stop at any point in there, or you can divert at any point to do what you want to do. And what we're saying is you can combine all of these processes into a single comprehensive process on the same sample. I asked, I don't know if you, you say this later. I am. You are? Oh, okay. Never mind. Okay. <laughs> cell extraction. The, here's the simplified process, the LMD analytical process. We do the cell extraction on everything that we want to. Again, if you look at a historical history part of the something, you see, okay, it's not going to be a semen mixture. So I'm just going to do a straight extraction. That's your choice. Or if you want to... Do this on vaginal samples or samples where you expect to have spermatozoa. That's your choice too. You can start this process there. That one you already go, you're already going to start it with cell extraction anyway. <coughs> Examination on the microscope, cell dissection, preamp digestion, amplification. And that hand and the hand up and the little point down is the font. That used to be a male and female symbol, but According to this computer, that's what, that's what it translates to in this font. <coughs> Again, during the cellular extraction, we can start with a presumptive test, APP30. That's no, there's nothing lost there. We're still using the supernate for those tests. We're just going to spot it onto the slide. Now we can do uh, the whole pellet on there. Now we can do an examination for, for spermatozoa, just like we always do, except for now the whole pellet is on the slide. We're going to do microsco microscopy, identify the cells. Is there any sperm there? Or do we see all diploid cells, all epithelial cells, or epithelial and blood cells? In other words, we're going, to, we're going to know what we're looking at. Now, we may not know if they're male or female cells, but we're going to know, hey, there's no sperm there or anything like that, or something like that. We then go to the cell dissection, which is, again, part of this whole process that we're talking about, the sex appropriate number of cells directly to the PCR tubes. That's what we've been talking about. We're not talking about doing extraction over here in one tube and taking out a sample and amplifying it. We're just going to do it all in one tube from the same slide. The preamp treatment, amplification, and data analysis, basically that's what we do anyway. We amplify them. We run, it, we run them through the thermal cycle, amplify them, and put them on the 
gel-based or capillary-based instrument where we get the data analysis. But the most important thing with this is we use microscopy to identify the cells. We, we can make educated judgments on what to do with the sample. We don't have to go blindly with the fingernail scrapings into uh, testing or blindly into the vaginal sample, not knowing what all we have in there. Here's the process we're looking at. We start with a slide. We have an examination. We stain it or use differential interference contrast if we want to. We identify epithelium and spermatozoa. <coughs> if we can't find spermatozoa or they're very difficult to find, we can then go to the sperm paint or some type of fluorescent sperm identification. Here's that same slide. You can probably still see the sperm that's so bright in there. That's what's really neat about that. That's why I say it's, it's easier and faster and more confidence in negatives. And now the last, the third step, chromosome paint. If you're doing something like a fingernail scrapings or bite mark breast swab there, where there's a high probability of being mixture of victim and suspect with a male suspect, now you're able to look at that and see <coughs> epithelial cells, white blood cells, and see if you can identify male and female cells. If all of these do not work, Take a scalpel and cut the stain off and do a regular extraction. You can either do a regular differential or regular standard extraction of that pellet. And as Kelly showed, we've done that and we do not lose anything. We get the same results as if we had taken that pellet and run it directly through a differential extraction process or a standard extraction process. We don't lose any DNA there. We don't lose any capability. We still get, we may, you know, if we were able to separate sperm and epithelium, yeah, we may get better results, but we don't lose any information. That's the important part of this process, is you can do all of these steps and still not lose any information. As Kelly showed, or I talked about when I did the chromosome paint, you can take that sample even after hybridizing the Y probes to it, amplify it for YSTRs, and they're still there. So this whole process gives you lots of information and you can stop at any time, step out of it, and go on to the bottom one, or you can follow the whole process using the same slide, the same smear, and seeing here's all the possible information you have. You may only need to go to the first step. You may find spermatozoa right off the bat, and that's it. Stop right there. You may not find spermatozoa. So now you want to look at sperm paint. You look under the sperm paint, do you see spermatozoa? No, I don't see any spermatozoa. Then go to the chromosome paint. Do I see male cells? Remember the last slide I showed you. In the vaginal swab, we were able to identify male diploid cells. They may be there, but they may, they may, you would never see them otherwise. It may be a vasectomized male. It may be a very small quantity of semen. It may be a long time after intercourse. They may, for some reason, they may still be there. But all those samples are possible with this new process. In, all, in other words, all these processes are possible. The check marks show all the ones which we've performed and obtained DNA profile results from samples which are just like casework samples. Or from casework, non-probative casework samples. The only one we haven't actually done the DNA testing on is the sperm paint, and that's because we have very limited quantities of that. And we really haven't had time. We've done sent some attempts at it, uh, unsuccessful so far, but we really have only tried it once for the DNA. We just haven't had a chance to get all of that into the picture. But we've, we've done step one. Kelly and uh, <coughs> Christine have both shown results on those types of samples. Uh, step three. Uh, Jennifer Valentine wrote her master's thesis on doing that. She was the one, uh, that data I showed just a short while ago was data she got from probative cases. Uh, and we've also done step four. We've actually taken the pen slide and cut this thing off and put it in this tube and extracted the DNA from it. No loss in quantity, no loss in quality there either. So here we have this process, prepare the slide. Examine using bright field optics. If we see sperm, great. We'll cut them out and analyze them. 
If we don't see sperm, it's our choice. Do we want to go to the next step, the fluorescent label, fluorescent capabilities? Okay, we don't see sperm. Or maybe we see a few sperm. We say, you know, I saw a few, but maybe, there, maybe there's a few more in there. Stain the cell, stain the slide, put it on the fluorescent, identify. Are there, uh, did you find spermatozoa? If so, cut them out, proceed with the analysis. If not, you can say, okay, well, I really don't, this is not a sample I expect to find uh, diploid cells in, so I'm just going to excise the whole smear and see if there's something in there that maybe I missed. Or maybe just see if there's really nothing there at all. So you can excise it, or you can go to the chromosome paint, and then goes back to the fourth step or fifth step, extract the DNA from the slide. And again, anywhere in that procedure, you can jump to any of the others. You could step from step two right on down to step four. You don't have to do the sperm paint if you don't want to. But whatever you do, you will have information to make your decision. It's not just throwing it into an extract and saying, well, I hope something's coming up. You will be able to look at cells and say, yes, I did not find any spermatozoa. Or I did not find any male or female cells in there. In reality, this is, this is going to be helpful on, on even other types of evidence. But any time... Any type of sexual assault, I think just about any sexual assault evidence can be examined in this fashion, including the suspect's underwear. Because in that case, you'd be looking for female cells and stains. And usually now that would be in a situation where you have an overwhelming amount of male cells. And again, if we look back over this, the first step up, up, the first slides I had, okay, well, hey, you know, I've got this stain. I'm going to do differentials maybe, or I'm going to do a standard extraction. Now this whole process with the same set of evidence can all be handled through the differential interference contrast or exam bright field examination, uh, sperm paint, or chromosome paint. Again, you have intelligent information on how to proceed with the sample. And you can make the decisions based upon what you're seeing. And again, procedure time to prepare the slide, one to two hours. I think it's quicker than that, but just let it dry. Examine bright field optics. You, as Kelly was talking about, you can do it in 10 minutes. I put 30 to 60 minutes. Uh, fluorescent optics, sperm paint, it takes you 30 minutes. The sperm paint procedure I did is about 30 minutes to put a slide. Really, it's only about two or three minutes. Put it in there overnight and then examine it the next day to have a slight wash. Um, O OVN is overnight. Uh, chromosome paint takes about 30 minutes the first day, overnight, one hour plus examination to do the cleanups after that. And preamp and PCR and gel, what did I say? That's about one day. Is that about okay, Kelly? Yeah. Well, you can gel the final tomorrow. <coughs> yeah. yeah. Right now, the preamp's about three and a half hours. The PCR with 31 cycles is about three and a half hours. So that's seven right there. So you, you, you could basically could start. You were, in you were the working really hard that day. Next, yeah. <laughs> Get that gel on before you leave. But again, go back to this goal of a comprehensive process. Improve the processing of sexual assault evidence using the laser micro dissection microscope. This is something really different than just differential, differential extraction because this is something that works for the whole sexual assault kit. If you take a fingernail scrapings or a bite mark swab, you don't have to look for sperm, but you can look at it under the microscope. You can try to separate the male and female cells. At any of these processes, you can use intelligent examination or intelligent information and make intelligent choices about what to do with the sample. Expedite processing sexual assault evidence. I think we can do that with the even just the bright field and the vaginal samples where we're looking for spermatozoa. But we also have the enhanced capability of identifying spermatozoa in very difficult samples. We also have the new capability of being able to separate male and female diploid cells through the X and Y chromosome painting. And that, that's a new capability. You can't do that right now. This microscope it will be unique in the capability of doing that. And again, the acknowledgments for the people that have worked on this project, Jennifer, Kelly, the Crime Lab for letting us do it, and again, the Health Science Center for 
helping Jennifer with her master's thesis. So, any questions? Or I think we're back into discussion now. <coughs> so we can go right into that's is that it? Yeah, that's it. We have the next uh, 15 minutes if anyone has like additional questions on anything we've done the last two days. Or so, feedback, you know, anything you thought of while Pat was talking. Do you feel like with this class, for those of you who don't have a microscope, which I think is GBI, wait, are you getting, you said you were getting one? Oh, if you guys just decide. <laughs> I mean, do you think with the information you got from the class, for those of you who don't have a microscope, do you feel you have more um, leverage now to getting one? You feel like you can go back and sell it? I mean, do you feel like you have a way, too, of saying, look, we can do this and this is how? You know, here's some ways we can actually get this going for our casework or whatever. You do feel that way, that's good. You, you know, when we got the microscope, we didn't know that these capabilities were possible. So we were going out kind of blindly. We knew the, the identifying the sperm was out there, but we didn't know these other procedures could be used. I mean, we had ideas, but at least you guys, well now when you're looking at it, you say, hey, these are things that, that have actually been done on evidence. Yes, they're still in the, uh, improvement stage or development stage, but we know that they have been done on actual evidence samples, and they can be done on evidence samples. So that's something you can look at. It's just a matter of improving it. Uh, what What's kind of your opinion of that process? I mean, it's not in place yet, but it's just our idea of, of a goal or a path that we're trying to follow to get there. I mean, I haven't got a whole lot of critique on it because you're, you're only about the second or third audience that's ever heard it. I mean, you guys are really unique. When the, you know, when the technical leaders and managers come and say, well, you know, you guys are the second people to see all this stuff. Well, I think it's good for single samples, but if you can batch cases, then, you know, you can't really batch it with hair. So, no, you can't. So batching casework almost would be equal. Would it be equal? Speed. It could be. Depends on how many. I mean, we do batch work. And Actually, now, what do you mean by batching? Because... You, this is what I do when, I, when I'm cutting. Okay, but remember, I cut into the TE4 like I was talking about, and then I dry off, okay? So I could take quite a few sample, you know, quite a few cases, now obviously one at a time, do my screening of each case, make my slides, okay? You know, and that's, that's definitely, you're, screen, you're screening alone, and if you're doing a bunch of cases, it's going to take some time. Um, make a slides, and then I can take, uh, let's say I have five cases I did my screening of, a, you know, APPSA, made my slide. Take those five slides, take them to the microscope, one at a time, you know, one case at a time on the microscope, set of tubes just for that one case, cut my sperm, cut my epis. Do that for f all five cases. And then remember, if you have good, um, good sperm, you know, a good amount of sperm on your slide, it's not going to take you long to, c to do your cuttings. Um, so let's say I cut all five, sam you know, all five cases in one day, which I think would definitely be feasible, probably even by lunch, doing that. Go upstairs, put them in the vacuifuge, you know, whether, whether we could do those all in one vacuifuge, you know, it's a pretty good one. I don't know. See, that's a QC issue. They, they've never, we've tried that, and we've never had problems yeah. with cross-contamination of the vacuifuge. So drying off the TE, I can stick those in the freezer, okay? So, you know, I'd say, so as far as batching, you know, I'm not sure what you mean by that, because there is definitely a way of batching. Again, this is, this is still conducive to batching. But also, the way we, we have batch casework that we can do 96 volt amps and we can get 15 to 20 sexual assaults done in four days doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's. Now, can you separate male and female diploid mixtures in the batch? No, that's what's interesting. No, that's cool because you can definitely do. And again. Uh, let me go back to your example, Kelly. Say you have 10 cases that you're going to do. <laughs> On eight of them, you're able to identify spermatozoa and cut. You have the other two, you set the other two to the side. Next day, you do sperm paint or fluorescent sperm identification and, and check them as a batch. Or maybe you save up eight or ten of those to, as a batch. So there's, there's things you can do. I mean, we haven't even gone through all this process. Like Kelly's saying, we're, she could do five of them in the morning. Well, you put one aside, and, and then maybe you do the same thing for your, your chromosome paint. You can put four or five of those together that you're going to do like that. Oh. I mean, you can't always do them in the same well or something like that, but you can certainly process them at the same time. Right, but there are the added advantages of your clean separation, your interpretation for your reports, your, your statistical analysis. Yeah. Yeah. To it. I'm right, not, right. I'm not saying, oh, I'm going to go back and say, forget yeah. it. It's yeah. just, you can, you can definitely 
Th this is not going to beat sh sure, this is sure. not going to beat a robotics automated system. But with that, I believe you give up some quality. The quality being that you have to handle every sample the same way. Uh, you can't if you have a you're gonna you're probably going to miss some where you have very weak spermatozoa or very few spermatozoa. If you put them all in there in the same set of conditions. If you've got a great sample with a number of spermatozoa, you're probably going to go all the way through them. And that may be 75% of the cases. What about the 25% that have a marginal amount of spermatozoa or a large amount of epithelium? This, this batch processing tends to level the playing field. The bad ones stay down here, the good ones come up, and you just, but you've got numbers. I've done, what would you say, 26 a week or something like that? It's like you know, 20 or so. 20 or so a week. Well, you've got the numbers. You get the cases out. But where, where in this process is there quality issues? I mean, yeah, you probably get most of them right, but this one, I think your quality goes way, way up. The same if you work them individually. You can, you can make a little bit more intelligent choice. That robot's not going to make any choices. That's kind of like Andy was showing in there. This robot can pick out all these spots, but it really can't differentiate them. When you put a batch in there, yeah, you can, you're going to get some right, some you're just going to have to pass over because you're, you're giving up quality, and not a whole lot of quality, but some quality to get the numbers. That, that's, that's where your trade-off is. At what point do you want some really high quality work versus numbers? I don't know if during the discussions over the last couple of days the semi-automated morphological recognition by algorithms that would be loaded onto the, the microscopic part would then trigger a matrix in a full field matrix, kind of like gunshot residue does on scanning electron microscopes. Is that coming down the hill at some point where a human won't really need to be doing more than just verifying that some that may be giving spotty <coughs> results after this is all semi-automated? Didn't, that didn't FBI quit doing gunshot with? residue? I used to do that. Yeah, we used to do it by hand and you do one yeah, I used to scan the same one like Martin Martin stuff there and twist this and look for <coughs> bright spots. Yeah, now the instrument automatically tells you where to look, and the human can find a bunch of particles immediately that way, right. yet it's already scanned the whole planchette for you. Is that where this might be going with semi-automated approach to morphological Andy triggering? was showing some of that stuff in there, and it, it picked up a lot of stuff that wasn't the right stuff. And today, it's, it's not there. I mean, that's, that's the holy grail for all of you. Uh, the joke was, you know, set it up there. Tell it where to go and then go for coffee. I mean, that's that's what you all want. Press a button and give me the results. Um, I'm 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 optimistic. To say is that is that we're close. I think there needs to be some customization. Um, as I said earlier, software is does not replace the human. It just doesn't replace the human. Um, there's something I wanted to go back to for a minute as far as the automation. Speaking from experience, I have been doing casework for 10 years now, so I know exactly what it's like to work in a lab. You know, I've worked in a large lab, I've worked in a small lab, and I'm honestly, it's funny, my, my old boss came up to me one of the first times I saw her after I moved to Shreveport. Oh, are you bored yet? I just about felt, I just, I laughed, because honestly, I probably do more work at the small lab than I did at the big lab, and we did a lot of work at the big lab. So, but speaking from experience, I know what it's like to have a boss. We need to get these cases done, get them out, get them out, get them out. And as a forensic scientist, a forensic biologist, I'm not sure what it's like to be like a firearms examiner or whatever, but we're always walking this fine line of get the cases done fast, but make sure you're putting out good quality. So the faster, sometimes the faster you do, the more you're sacrificing the quality. So, you know, but you don't want to go slow because you know, the DAs are breathing down your neck. You know? It should have been done yesterday. We've got a serial rapist out there, you know, whatever. So believe me, I know that, right, as far as automation, gosh, it'd be great to be able to automate and get things done so fast. But at the same time, I think I agree with Pat, where sometimes then you're sacrificing the quality. So it's, again, it's up to the lab, you know, what your goals are. Uh, who is your, you know, your boss? He may just be interested in those numbers, you know. I mean, th this is my belief. I, I believe you really work the case as best you can. I, I know our, our hardest cases, and Kayla will tell you the same thing, the hardest cases for the analyst are the negative ones. It's easy. If you can go in there and find spermatozoa in the first few minutes, you're, you're ready to go. You've got that vaginal swab, and that's how we limit our samples. But if we don't find spermatozoa, we can't find it, we check, keep checking, incrementally checking the case and additional evidence. 
we don't we don't have no limitations on what they can submit to us yeah and that takes forever sometimes but a negative case is the hardest one but we'd rather have some good work on it or good Why? high quality work than just sheer numbers but yes we do Why, yes, our unknown welcome. suspect we we drop the quality <laughs> to increase the numbers for screening there are some laboratories that still out there we're doing AP PSA and microscopic examination without ever really looking at the evidence and if they don't see that it's gone forget it but yet I, I, what would you say our percent now is on making our cases on badge I'm on bite mark and neck swabs what do you mean sorry what on, if you don't find any, you know if you did only screening vaginal samples and if you did not find sperm AP or p30 you can the case but we're getting a, a substantial part number of our cases where the neck swabs and bite marks, breast swabs, and fingernail scrapings are making the case. Well, um, see, I think a lot of that now has to do with a sane, you know, a sexual assault nurse examiner doing the collection versus, let's say, just a doctor that's not trained. Because a lot of these sane nurses are doing, um, they're, they're asking, let's say, more, more of the right questions, and they're doing the correct swab, you know, swabbing the neck, the ear, you know, if they're licked, the breast, you know dried secretions or whatever and so if I we're getting more and more kits I think now because um, we have more sayings in our service area than we used to and they mm -hmm. um, they do a lot of these neck swabs and stuff so yeah I would say more now we're getting more of these and I know I've done quite a few and I, I st I've had quite a few I've never done a number crunching but I do have quite a few that have given me a, a mixture of male and female and the only time we've gotten those samples have been on like a neck swab the 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 vaginal samples have all been negative. Mm -hmm. I know there's been several cases where the only thing we found in the case was the male profile in the fingernail scraping or the male profile in the neck swab. So if all you're doing is vaginal samples through a screen, you're dropping the quality right there. But you're getting numbers. Yeah. And I, and I know there's still a lot of laboratories that that's all they need. They get a rape kit, look, check that vaginal smear slide in there, do a P30 AP, and if those are negative, that case is finished. And that, but again, it's, that it's out there. I'm not saying anyone lab yeah. here does it, but there are that, labs that do that. And I, that depends on the policy of the, you know, the, the lab. You know, I mean, because there are all different kinds of policies, and um, you know, because you know, if there's a large volume of cases, if if you're a large lab and you've got a large volume of cases, I mean, there's got to be a way to try to just get through them as you know the way you can. So I can completely understand that part. You know, and every place, again, has different policies. So saying, like, you know, we're a pretty substantially big lab. We have 100 employees just in bioscience alone. And we had our rate, when I first started seven years ago, um, our backlog for sex assaults was in the hundreds, close to thousands. And we are current now. Good, yeah. We are current, and we've done that by in severely increasing our forensic scientists, um, as well as, um, where was I going with this? <laughs> um, we have sex assault. Automated. We have sex assault days. We they're not, we, we are oh. automated, but not for um, sex assaults yet. But we also have sex assault days, mm -hmm. like maybe one day a month. Yes, and by you, having all of our employees complete one sex assault a month, yeah. you're, we're, we're cutting our backlog down humongously. I mean, supervisors, everybody, you just set aside one day. Sometimes it may take two days to complete the case, you know, depending on, you right. know, if you got to do a PSA, then mm -hmm. you're talking to, a, you know, incubation and whatnot. See, but now your lab is lucky in, in where you've ha you have been given the funding to uh, hire people. See, that's probably the biggest problem with forensic biology labs is that, yeah, they, they give us money for um, equipment and supplies. I mean, that happens to our lab all the time. We have plenty of money for that stuff, right. but we don't yeah. have money for people. <laughs> You can't pay for a person one time and keep them for ten, ten years. That's a whole nother ball of wax, but yeah.